food, man, evolution, and their relationship. Let's define our terms and be sure what we are talking about. What is food? There is food to sustain us physically, and there is food to sustain us mentally, and there is food to sustain us spiritually. There is a relationship between these three foods themselves. Food that we take for our physical well-being to sustain the human physical body is not effective unless the food that we take for our mind and the food that we take for our soul is also effective. We may go on eating all kinds of food, but the absorption of that food as nutrients in the body is conditioned by what food we are taking for the mind and for the soul. We have been able to analyze our food needs through the process of simple examination of the biochemistry of the human body and the metabolic changes that take when we grow, when we consume energy to work and when we decay by aging. It is noticed that these three processes of growth, of consumption of energy and of aging or decay all need food. Food is used to replace the cells which are either needed for extra building up at the stage of growth or are needed to replace those which are consumed or are needed when the old ones are decaying and dying out. We have a very remarkable structure of the human body consisting of so many kinds of tissues, bones, ligaments, skin, flesh, blood, other lymphatic fluids, that it would be difficult to think of a single food to cover all the needs of different parts of the human body. Surprisingly, the human body has a set of digestive devices built into it, converts food of one kind into another as required by different parts of the human body. We are quite satisfied if we can broadly take adequate intake of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and vitamins. And we feel that if these things come into the body, they can be broken up by the internal devices into different cell structures that either add to the existing physical structure or they replace the worn out one or they replace the dying and decaying ones. Thus we try to achieve a balance in our food by the composition of what we take in the mouth by way of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals and vitamins. These foods in turn are based upon the needs of the body and the manner of our lifestyle which creates certain deficiencies as we use up some nutrients in the body. The nutrients are put into the body by virtue of the mechanism of replacement of cells and the system of circulation, both the lymphatic sympathetic system and the blood circulation system, they help to take the nutrients in any part of the body where they are required. The metabolic process of growth takes care that the building blocks that are required in, by way of protein are placed in proper position at the right place and they take the structure of the molecules which are needed at that particular location. Thus, if we need more skin cells, then the metabolic process will see to it that the protein is converted into skin tissue and placed at the right place. If we need more bone tissue, then the metabolic process places the nutrients in the same molecular composition as the bones and they reach the right place. 
It's a very efficient, though a somewhat complicated system that sustains the human body. When these nutrients travel in the body, they have some problems to encounter. If we put in too much nutrition, they can create congestion. If we do not put enough nutrition, they can create deficiency. If we put the wrong composition of the nutrients, they can create imbalance. So you can have surfeit of food, you can have deficiency of food, and you can have imbalanced food. When you have surfeit of one item of food and deficiency of the other, you can create a different kind of imbalance. Imbalances need not be only between the broad categories I have mentioned, namely carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals and vitamins. Imbalances can occur within these groups also. The most vulnerable group for imbalances is the protein group. In the case of proteins, the individual constituents of proteins are the amino acids. There are about 50-55 amino acids which are actively participating in the protein food that we take. Some of these amino acids, by their deficiency, can make the protein itself imbalanced. We find that several common proteins, uh, which are found in the cereals that we take, are deficient in the amino acid lysine. And therefore, although we may take excess of protein, the effective protein absorbed in the system is so much the less because of the deficiency of lysine amino acid in the protein. On the other hand, one can have excess, ha have excess of lysine. In which case, the other protein amino acids become deficient. Some of the sulfur-bearing amino acids, which are required only in traces, are very effective in small quantities to make the rest of the protein molecule assimilable in the human system. Thus, a balance is required not only between different nutrients that go into the body, but even between each nutrient. In the matter of protein, I have a few more words to say. Proteins can be derived from a number of sources, vegetable sources, animal sources. Now, the large number of vegetable proteins that are available to us, consisting of different kinds of beans and lentils and pulses and peas, these uh, proteins found in vegetables growing through soils are very good, but they have individual problems which make it difficult for them to be fully assimilated. Properly treated, these proteins are very good uh, nutri nutrients for the human system. They are light, more easily digested, more natural and fit in with the physical body of the man. They correspond with the structure of the human body, the size and shape of the teeth, the size and shape of the jaws, the muscles of the jaws, the mu muscles of the digestive tract, the muscles of the stomach lining. All these are designed to absorb vegetable protein. We have, in the course of time, tried to change our food habits based mainly on the desire for acquiring new tastes into eating non-vegetarian or animal proteins. Animal proteins, even if they are fully uh, modified, are in fact harder to digest, harder to assimilate and are not natural foods. We have in creation around us, living beings who are more designed for animal foods. The lion or the tiger, for example, is designed to eat animal food. Its, its teeth, its digestive system, its uh, circulatory system, the entire body uh, physiology is based upon, and anatomy is based upon the uh, natural food of a lion or a tiger being non-vegetarian, that means animal food. But in the case of a big uh, animal like elephant, it is vegetarian food. It is not the size of the animal that determines whether he is designed or structured for vegetarian food or for non-vegetarian food. Nature has distributed all living things into categories and divided them into the kind of food they will take. 
man comes clearly in the category of vegetarian animals and therefore his body is designed to receive vegetarian proteins. Now, the next term which we should be able to define is man himself. Man consists not only of the physical body which needs physical food but also the entire nervous system, the sensory perception, the mental structure of the brain and the spirit of man which makes him alive and kicking, which makes him conscious. Thus, man can be divided into three categories. One, the physical man consisting of the body. The mental man in which we may include the sensory perceptions as well, as well as mental perceptions. And the spiritual man which is the soul of man or the origin of the consciousness and life of man. Man cannot be regarded as a mere physical being and certainly not so in the matter of food. What is food for thought? is as important as food for the body. A man who has terrible thoughts is unable to digest good physical food for the physical body. A man who is happy, cheerful and has bliss and joy in his mind is able to digest even difficult food and absorb it into his system. Thus man must get, get adequate food for his mind, adequate food for his senses. That is why people who see lovely sights get joy and cheer and use their mind and intellect fully are able to absorb their food better. Those who are seeing ugliness, misery and are themselves depressed and not too happy in their minds have a hard time even digesting their food. The spiritual man is of course the controller of the other two men, the physical and the mental. The spiritual man is what makes man alive and conscious. It is only life that provides the metabolic movement. If a man is not alive, he does not have any metabolism. There is no growth. There is no replacement of cells. The moment a man dies and is no longer having the spirit of life in him, he has lost the growth process. The very structure of the cells which was sustaining further intake and nutrition becomes dead and does not allow any more food to be absorbed in the system. Thus life or consciousness is the force that gives vitality to man, makes food more assimilable than otherwise. A man who is spiritually wide awake can get the best out of food. Even a small amount of food will give him all the nutrition he wants because his capacity to absorb the nutrients in food has been enlarged considerably. People who have reached higher levels of spiritual awareness find that they have to eat very little and even with very little food they get all the nutrition they want. The metabolic process alters depending upon the degree of awareness a man has acquired. Thus when we talk of man and food we must not forget that we are talking of the physical, the mental and the spiritual man and in order of importance the spiritual man determines what the mental and physical man can eat, the mental man in turn determines how much the physical man can eat and the physical man determines what quantities of nutrients should go in what proportion. Evolution, the third term we are using in this title. Evolution is the progressive development of man from the lowest form of a being to the highest. Darwin proved that through natural selection and evolution, man can be created out of a plant. That progressively, through genetic selection, the plant undergoes a transformation to higher species and as its intelligence grows, eventually it becomes a man. The composition of the structure of plants, the fish and fowl, the animals of other categories the, and finally the human being is basically different. We find that in the case of plants for example, a bulk of the structure of a plant consists of water. An overwhelming proportion of a plant is water or liquids. In the case of some of the higher species of reptiles like snakes, 
we find that there is hardly any water. There is much less water, but there is much greater vital heat compared to the plants. So they excel in having vital heat and in solid substances. If you look at birds and some of the flying creatures, you find that their bodies are filled far more with air and with gaseous material. And they have much less water and much less of vital heat. In the case of mammals, other animals uh, walking on four feet, you find that they have more or less all these elements of solids, liquids, warmth, and gases equitably distributed. In the case of man, not only are these four elements of bodily structure equitably distributed, we have the fifth element, the sense of reason, the ability to use free will, the ability to use logic, the ability to think. Thus, in the oriental system of analysis of all creation, they have been able to divide creation by the number of elements. Creatures with one predominant element, water, would be plants. Creatures with two predominant elements would be reptiles, heat and solids. Or could be birds, solids and air. Creatures with three of these could be some of the birds in the water or big birds like ostriches some of the smaller kind. Creatures with three of these could be some of the birds in the water or big birds like ostriches or some of the smaller kind of animals. Creatures with all four elements are the bigger animals like dogs, horses, cows, buffaloes, elephants and so on. And the only creature with five developed elements, namely the solids, the liquids, the gases, the heat, and reason is man. This is of course not a classification by the chemical elements. This is merely a classification by the elements in their form. And therefore it's a rough and ready classification. But as it is, this classification corresponds strikingly and in a very strange coincidence with the degree of intelligence of these beings. It is noticed that if there is more than one of these five elements in a living thing, it has more intelligence than the one which has less. Thus all these animals have more intelligence than plants. And even amongst plants, it is found that the mammals, four-legged creatures with all the four elements, have greater intelligence than the reptiles or the birds or some of the creatures which have lesser than four elements. But man with all five elements seems to have the best composition of all. And he has the composition in which he can not only have intelligence much higher than all animals, but of an extremely unique character because of the fifth element of reason. Darwin proved that we move from a plant to the animal kingdom to man. And this is a natural selection and the evolution occurs over time. The philosophers of the Orient have been saying the same thing for thousands of years. Darwin came only now. They have been saying that man has evolved through all forms of life, starting from the plants and going on to animals and then becoming a man. Darwin made one mistake. He thought that man had went upon this earth was only once. And that was very recently. Not more than 250,000 years ago. A quarter million years ago. After Darwin passed away, further research done on the existence of man upon the earth has shattered this assumption. The elder Professor Leakey's work in African coal mines was able to establish more more than three decades ago, that man existed before a quarter million years ago. Some of the fossils clearly established that man was here a million years ago. Work done by the junior Nikis and the other colleagues of theirs have now established that man lived 10 million years ago. And some fossils are confirming the 
advent of man upon this earth 20 million years ago. In other words, man has not come only recently upon the earth. But one possible explanation to reconcile the point of view of Darwin and the Leakeys could be that there were several series of evolutions and that man came through several series of evolutions again and again. This seems to be very plausible because even today we have many of the plants and other lower forms of life which existed in the beginning from which man evolved. If it was a one-time evolution, all these other forms of life should have been destroyed while man was being created and we should have been left only with the top few species of life. The fact that we still have coexisting with the final product man, the earliest product plants, shows that there must have been a series of evolutions. This is indeed my belief too, that man has always existed upon this earth and has come from various strands of evolution. But Darwinian evolution only explains the physical man. Darwinian evolution only slightly hints at the possibility that the physical brain of man while developing also increased his intelligence. It does not really account for the development and evolution of intelligence as such. It does not show how intelligence was evolving. If intelligence itself evolved, then the process need not have been to the genes which we are associating with the evolution of the physical bodies. The physical bodies took characteristics from the ancestors through genes, the genetic vehicles which carry the pattern of the wisdom of cells in any body. That creative intelligence itself is evolving independently of the physical bodies and sometimes coexists with it is a great discovery. It would seem to suggest that consciousness or the ability to be intelligent is persisting beyond physical forms and is itself in the process of evolution. Where is this consciousness persisting? There is now so much evidence on reincarnation. There is so much evidence of people remembering their previous births. There is so much evidence of people foreseeing the future. There is so much evidence of life after death that it is difficult to reject, even scientifically, the empirical evidence coming before us that man in consciousness persists beyond his human body. Not only man, every living thing seems to persist and the intelligence goes on beyond the living physical form. If that is so, then evolution is not merely the development of a higher form of physical life from a lower form of physical life. Evolution would also include the development of higher form of intelligence from the lower form of intelligence. And the two can be coterminous. Indeed, a higher form of intelligence would normally take the shape and form of a higher physical being. Thus, the two things go together. It is as if there is a being who is conscious, intelligent and is growing up and that he is using various forms and bodies as if he is changing his clothes as he grows in size. As a child, he uses small clothes and he grows up, he uses bigger clothes. The size keeps on changing depending upon what height and weight he is gaining. Similarly, as consciousness seems to be gaining height and weight in creative intelligence, it keeps on changing bodies from plant kingdom and eventually reaches the human form. This uh, combination of evolution of both creative intelligence and the physical form is what makes the study of evolution so fascinating. And if we do not study both aspects of evolution, we are missing a very important point in the story of evolution. Now, I have only defined the three terms, food, man and evolution. I must say that they are very closely related. If you will notice, the food also has changed according to the needs of the living being, the needs of the physical form of the living beings at different stages of evolution. Let us first notice that in this earth, on this earth, in this universe, life subsists on life. There is no living thing which is not living by virtue of extinguishing other living things. If life is subsisting on life, then obviously the very process of growth is becoming the food. The very annihilation of 
life or the process of growth is being used as food by living beings. Man endowed with reason has been built to take vegetarian food. But being endowed with reason and free will sometimes chooses to take unnatural foods. Not only foods, he chooses to lead unnatural lives. Man is designed for a particular natural function. When he does not perform those natural functions, then he leads an unnatural life and even consumes unnatural food. Unnatural food creates unnatural consequences and man suffers. That is why, in spite of the fact that all living things have their periods of pleasure and pain, it is only man who can suffer intensely, mentally, even when he is having pleasure, even when there is no external pain. It is only man who can create mental pain for himself and suffer without nature providing him any stimulus for such pain. Other animals will only suffer pain or pleasure depending upon the environment in which they are placed. Only man has this unique quality of living unnaturally and creating pain where none exists and thus create suffering for himself. This unnatural behavior of man arises from his eminence in this scale of evolution because he has the power of free will to choose what he will eat, to choose what he will do. If man relies excessively on the development of his mind and the mental man is predominant in a man, he is likely to act unnaturally. The mental man has a tendency to go in for a variety of pleasures and is not content with one state of being. He likes to resist the environment and likes to analyze and break up into pieces whatever he finds. Therefore, his natural tendencies, because of his mind, make him do unnatural things. He cannot be living in harmony with his environment. It is unnatural to the mind to live in harmony with its environment. That property has been given to the spiritual side of man, the soul of man. The soul of man has been created to live in harmony, in synthesis, in totality with environment. If man uses his higher awareness of the soul, he will live in harmony and he will overcome the mind. Therefore, a man who is developed spiritually will have no problems and will not act unnaturally. He will always act naturally. But the man who is relying heavily on the mind will act unnaturally. Unnatural food, as I have explained earlier, for a man is the non-vegetarian food. When man consumes meat foods, he is acting against nature. And when he consumes meat foods, he not only makes all systems function unnaturally, he loads up the system with less digestible food, loads of the system with high cholesterol, loads of the system with the problems of digestion and so on and he loads up the system with an adverse effect upon his mental and spiritual self. The food that a man takes is directly related to the subconscious mind of man. When food is consumed by extinguishing life of a higher order of intelligence than plants, it affects the subconscious mind to an extent that it vicariously accepts responsibility for extinguishing that life. In that position, man becomes guilty and in guilt he punishes himself and therefore he loses his capacity to concentrate his attention. A man who is taking consistently vegetarian food has a much better power of concentration of attention than a man who has been taking non-vegetarian foods. This can be easily verified by experimentation. I have had occasion to test this out several times. I have tested it out on very highly developed spiritual leaders like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, as well as many other uh, yogis and others who challenged the, the need to take vegetarian food during meditation. I did not go into too much of intellectual debate on the merits of the food. In the case of those who wanted to do spiritual and meditational practices, I just put them to the test that you try meditation with the two kinds of food. And as I have observed, they turned vegetarians, provided they were serious in their meditation. Thus, the intake of food affects the mental and the spiritual man and affects the evolution of intelligence. These then would be the relationship between food, man, evolution. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Sure. If there are any questions, I shall be very glad to answer. Mr. Puri, you said that uh, the vegetarian food seems to be a natural food. Then why is it that the majority of the Western society uh, eat meat foods and advertise heavily over the television and how good it is for you? Why do they do this? Uh, is it unnatural? That's a very good question you have asked. As I said, that man and food are related to each other. Depending upon what man is doing to himself, he will do to his food. If man is living a natural life, he will eat natural food. If man is leading an unnatural life, he will ask for unnatural food. May I, in all humility, suggest to you that in Western societies, man is mostly leading an unnatural life. It is unnatural because there is an excessive reliance on intellect and mind. It, there is an excessive reliance on that faculty of man which breaks up life. I connect food with the rest of life. Look at the number of divorce cases you have. Look at the number of broken homes. Look at the state of the children in the Western societies. Look at what is going on. Look at how mind is breaking itself up. Look at the cases of nervous tension. I have a friend of mine who is a medical doctor in your country here. I keep on meeting him whenever I come to the United States. I am going to him next week now to talk to him. He is doing excellent business, making tons of money. So I ask him, look with all the good health in this country, how do you make tons of money? He said, oh, Mr. Puri, way back when I started my practice here, people used to come to me for medicine if they were ill. Now people come to me for medicine when they are well. They have cracked up their minds. And he told me how patients will come, a lady will walk into his clinic and say, doctor, tell me, am I all right? And I'll say, you are fine, ma'am. After checking her up, and I said, you are fine, ma'am, and she pays me $30 fee for saying that little simple thing. People are paying me because I'm healthy. If this is not unnatural, what else can be unnatural? If we are cracking up our own minds by an excessive use of intellect, is this a natural thing? And what has happened to the function of the soul, the capacity of man to love, the capacity of man to have knowledge through intuitive faculties, the capacity of man to see the beauty of the whole? What has happened? Are you doing it? Do you see what your universities are doing? Do you see what is happening in the Western societies? There is no reliance at all upon the natural functions of man, which is love, joy, beauty, intuition. When you are not building up the natural man, the unnatural man will naturally ask for unnatural food. That is why there is a demand for meat food and non-vegetarian foods. You will see when man evolves to higher intelligence of himself, and looks into his soul and asks for love instead of hatred. Asks for intuitive knowledge of the totality instead of the analytical breakup knowledge of the mind and intellect. And asks for the beauty of life instead of the ugliness of individual incidents of life. He will ask for vegetarian food himself. I am looking for the day when your great country will realize what's going on to human beings here and will come up with programs to develop the real spiritual man. Thank you very much.